Hello and welcome back to The Drag Detective, where today we are finally going to discuss one of the most controversial seasons literally ever, I think, at this point. People still talk about the season to this day, years later, and we are going to break it all down episode by episode. I remember the excitement I had when All Stars 4 was announced. The cast, the promo, good lord, this promo was the moment. It still is the moment. Talk about a cast where truly anybody could win. All right, almost anybody could win. I'm just going to say it, All Stars 4 is one of the most well-produced and iconic seasons of Drag Race ever. Well, um until the finale, but we will get there. But first... The most annoying thing to me as a content creator is when I'm trying to make a video on a Drag Race season and it's not available on any of the streaming services here in the US. But that is what is so great about today's video sponsor, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN makes the internet more accessible and secure for its more than 6 million users worldwide. Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Disney Plus all have geo restrictions due to licensing rights. This means that hundreds of exclusive shows may not be available to you based on your location. But with Atlas VPN, you can bypass geo restrictions and access your favorite content from across the world. For me, I can watch any season of RuPaul's Drag Race or any of my other favorite TV shows just by changing my location in Atlas VPN, which makes creating content so much easier. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. You can get a three-year subscription for only $1.99 with a 30-day money-back guarantee. The link to get that discount is in the description of this video below, as well as the pinned comment. So thank you so much, Atlas VPN, for sponsoring today's video. This season was packed with storylines coming into the season. So we have Valentina and Pheromone competing again after their fight at the Season 9 reunion. We have Manila and Latrice competing as individuals after flopping All-Stars 1 as a pair. Monet and Monique coming on right after Season 10 and trying to find redemption. Gia Gunn coming back as one of the greatest villains the show has ever seen. I mean, that's 7 out of the 10 queens coming in with a storyline already set up. And all of those storylines play a big part in how the season turned out. Now, Naomi, Trinity, and Jasmine are the three that don't have a narrative right off the bat. And we're going to talk about each of them as the video progresses. Before we dive into the meat and potatoes, though, I just want to make a quick note. There are several queens on the season who have said and done some things that I definitely don't agree with. I know a lot of other people definitely don't agree with. And the fandom has soured on them in general because of these statements that they've said. But let's just keep the comment section cute. I mean, we're here to discuss their runs on a television show. So let's not stoop to their level and get nasty in the comments. If I see lines being crossed, I will delete gross comments. I've noticed that my comment section has gotten really nasty lately and how people talk about the queens. And um, yeah, we're just not going to do that. <laughs> but like I always do... Let's look at the cast and pick out who might have been some of production's favorites going into the season. Now, there's a lot of fan favorites on this cast. Trinity, The Tuck at the time, Valentina, Manila, Latrice, Monet, even Monique to a lesser extent on season 10 was a fan favorite. That immediately is going to give you a boost in the producer's eyes since they know if the fan faves make it far, the fans will keep watching. Now, Manila and Latrice, I also think, come in with a huge advantage. I mean, they're obviously both drag and drag race legends at this point, and I think production definitely were looking at them to kind of justify bringing back past All-Stars. Latrice was even asked for All-Stars 3, which she turned down, so production definitely wanted to get the bang out of their buck out of these two. I don't mean to sound, like, dismissive, or like I'm diminishing their talents as drag entertainers, but it was said a lot at the time, and I do believe it now based on their edits and their placements, that Jasmine Masters, Pheromone, and Gia Gunn were fully all meant to be the first three eliminated, especially looking at the Lala Perusa twist, which is a twist they knew they had coming later in the season. 
I mean, none of these three are, like, lip-sync assassins on the show, so it would pair well with that twist for these three to go early. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We can talk about that later. Let's dive into episode one, the variety show. The tomfoolery, the robbery, the foolishness, and the audacity, that's all I have to say. I mean, just kidding. You know I have about five minutes more to say about this variety show. So the bottom three we can kind of gloss over, right? Monet, Jasmine, and Pheromone, they each struggled in different ways, and they all deserved the placements that they got. But the tops. One thing about this variety show that makes it very difficult to gauge is all of the behind-the-scenes tea that we have on it since there was a live audience there. Stuff that didn't make the air. So we know that they film each variety show number twice to make sure they get all the right angles and shots, but also to have two options to show in order to justify the critiques that they want to give. Lemon, I mean, just talked about how they used the worst take of her variety show on UK vs. The World, despite her having one that was flawless, and then they used that to justify her being in the bottom two. The issue here is that there were a ton of mess-ups in different takes of this variety show, according to the people who were in the audience. In one take, Monique lost her wig. In one take, Latrice dropped her baton. In one take, Gia Gunn dropped a fan. And Pheromone, then we saw messed up, not just in one take, but in both of her takes, which is why we got to see what we saw. We don't see um, any of that. I mean, they actually used the better Farrah take as when she did her number the second time after falling, she's visually frustrated and upset when she then messes up again. So it's hard to determine then if those mess ups that we as the viewers didn't get to see impacted the placements. If it's just me watching, I'm personally going to say Gia Gunn, Latrice, Manila, and Monique had the best talents of the night. But then you factor in three of them messing up a take. Is that maybe why Trinity and Naomi make up two of the top spots instead? Since they had kind of middle of the road performances, but they did theirs flawlessly both times. It's kind of hard to say. I was a humongous Trinity fan at the time, so I was thrilled that she was given a top two spot here. But even as a fan of hers, I was confused why she was getting such glowing critiques for her tucking performance. I mean, yeah, she did turn it into a talent, but it was sort of awkward and the song was really annoying. I mean, I guess this is the kind of humor that RuPaul loves, a la like Yara Sophia on season six of All Stars. I don't know. And also specifically showed off her brand, right, as this new Trinity, the tuck, not the artist formerly known as Trinity Taylor, and she didn't have any mess-ups and seemed confident throughout. Naomi had a hilarious reveal at the end of her performance and one of the best Rue Girl songs we've heard on the show, period, but the whole first half of her performance was kind of a snooze fest. So did she deserve a top placement? Gia, Latrice, and Manila all brought something completely new to the variety show, which felt very stale the season prior due to so many just lip sync performance after lip sync performance the whole time. It was nice to have so many girls bring something fresh and fun, but in the end, a comedy routine and a dance routine were the top two, just like in the past two seasons. It's been said over and over again, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I ain't gonna rewind the wheel! You gotta read about the wheel! I gotta read about the wheel! But Gia, but Gia Gunn 1000% deserved a top two spot for her kabuki routine. It showed off her heritage. It showed a completely different side to Gia that we have seen on the show. It was well thought out. And if she did drop a fan in one take, well, guess what? We as viewers don't know that. So who cares? The other spot, I mean, it could have gone to Manila, Latrice, Monique, and there's arguments for all three. But when I said Gia, Jasmine, and Farah were meant to be the first three out, the evidence starts here. Because if they wanted Gia to be a main player on the season, or to stick around for a while, they could have given her a top two spot here very easily. The fact that they didn't is just kind of proof to me that she was there for drama, she was there to be a bad bitch, and to be the villain and bring entertainment and conflict and that was it just do that for a few episodes before bowing out 
And remember when I said Trinity didn't have a storyline coming into the season? Well, her storyline gets set up right here in this episode. She is the big threat. She is the competitive bitch who is going to fight and claw her way to the final four. Very Alaska on All Stars 2, right? And that is the arc that is going to continue for her until the finale. I do think keeping Manila and Latrice from the top in this premiere episode put a slight pin in their like big threat storyline. I mean, if both of them were in the top in the very first episode, it's going to light a fire under all of the other queen's asses even more to try and top them and knock them out. Plus, Latrice being in the top and Jasmine being in the bottom would have been a really cool dynamic to see since they're such close friends outside of the show. I would also have loved to see Latrice lip sync to emotions. So, like, how many other reasons do I need to throw out to justify a Gia Gunn and Latrice Royale top two? Let's just move on, because I could go on forever. Episode two is our girl group challenge, where icon, star, and legend Stacey Lane Matthews joins the girls. I know this is an unpopular opinion, but I actually love the two songs that they do in this episode, Everybody Say Love and Don't Funk It Up. Lizzo doing the vocals definitely helps. And um, yeah, this is just another challenge that I think a lot of girls did really well. Obviously, the top two of the week, Val and Monet, but I also think Naomi and Latrice had really great performances, too. And then we had the incredible runway that Manila wore, which is, I mean, one of the greatest gowns we have ever seen on this show. So yeah, this episode was stellar for me. Again, I definitely think it was a missed opportunity to not put Latrice in the top this week, especially since Naomi had just been in the top the week prior. Latrice had been safe now for two times in a row. I think definitely it diminished her threat level moving forward and led to kind of her elimination two episodes later. Now for the bottoms, this is two episodes in a row that Gia Gunn was safe and I fully disagreed. But this week, it's because she should have been in the bottom. I mean, let's be real. She fully had the worst verse out of all of the queens and her runway wasn't anything to keep her out of the bottom either. The problem is that Gia had been terrorizing literally everyone in the workroom and I think those queens were going to send her home literally the millisecond her ass was in the bottom, especially when the major plot of this episode is Gia bullying Pheromone. If given the chance, I think Valentina for sure would have saved Farah and sent Gia Gunn packing instead. But she said this since the season aired, that she was brought on for a very specific reason, to stir the pot and cause drama, and bitch Gia Gunn did her damn job. Love her or hate her, Gia makes amazing television, and losing her in the second episode would have been kind of a waste when there was still more of her story arc to tell. Monique instead gets thrown under the bus here, and when this episode first aired and they were critiquing her for her messy jacket removal, I didn't even, like, know what they were talking about. And to this day, like, I still don't think it's that noticeable. Like, unless I'm specifically looking for it, I don't think it's that distracting. Plus, Monique had one of the best vocals of the entire night. I think there's always an urge to give us, like, the Fall from Grace storyline on All Stars. All Stars 2, we have Tatiana and Roxy both in the bottom episode 2 after being in the top episode 1. All Stars 5, we see it play out again with India Farah. All Stars 6 with Yada Sophia. I think they're always secretly hoping a queen makes a big move and sends someone packing super early to kind of make like a gaggy moment. This right here, though, to me, is all the proof I need that WoW was not super invested in Monique as a potential winner, at least this early on. Production favorites almost never get sacrificed and put in the bottom to save another queen. They're not going to do that with someone they're not willing to potentially lose. Pheromone is the other bottom this episode, and oh, Farah. I actually think Farah gets a really wonderful storyline and arc this season, despite being the second one eliminated. I mean, these two episodes, as well as the comeback episode, really give her a ton of content showing what a sweetheart she is, but how she also won't take any of Gia Gunn's shit, and just wants to prove to herself and the world that she is a fierce drag queen. Plenty of second boots don't get much storyline at all, so it was really nice to see someone as genuinely good at drag and who seems like such a good person to get so much content and a full arc in their short amount of time. 
if you like Survivor Edgic people, she was basically CPP3 in every episode she was in, which I love to see. We also have Manila saying she purposely flopped this episode in order to not become a threat too soon. And she knew she had a killer runway to save her from the bottom. So take that for what it is. Whether you believe her or not is up to you. I think Manila had more to give in this challenge than she did since, I mean, she gave us the multi-diamond selling Grammy winning record Hot Couture. But the real tea about this episode that gags me to this day is Valentina. And this is going to be a bold statement, but I'm prepared to go to bat for this one. They 1000% paid Monet Exchange to lose this lip sync on purpose. You are going to tell me that Valentina wins the challenge that has an Ariana Grande lip sync to redeem her botched Ariana Grande lip sync from her original season, and then she gets to eliminate Pheromone, the bitch who roasted her on national television at their reunion. And the queen that she's lip syncing against, who is known for being a lip sync assassin, just so happens to give about like 20% of what she gives to every other lip sync she's done on this show. It left a bad taste in my mouth when it aired, and I still call bullshit today. There are no coincidences on reality television, and there were about 20 coincidences that had to occur here to get this result. Monet literally just, like, casually walking around the stage for most of the lip sync, while Valentina is dancing circles around her and pulling the world-famous cat vomit move. To Into You, one of the best pop songs of this millennium, I think not. Monet was definitely asked to flop the lip sync, but not make it look too obvious. So she like throws a little jump split and then goes back to like the park and bark. To, literally to Into You. Are you about to park and bark to Into You? Uh, but anyway, Valentina sends Pheromone home. That storyline gets a satisfying conclusion. And we move on to the Snatch Game of Love. Now, the Snatch Game was interesting because unlike most All-Star seasons, not many of these queens actually did well on their original Snatch Games. Naomi, Gia, and Monique all either went home or were in the bottom two. Latrice and Manila didn't do that well. Trinity and Valentina did fine. Really, Monet is the only queen who was solid on their original Snatch Game. Now, what's strange is how they broke up the queens here. Since we have two groups of four, and this is the first time they've done this, the three queens who did the best in their Snatch Games, Trinity, Monet, and Valentina, are all in one group together. And then the four that didn't do well were all in a group together. I think that they were definitely betting on Manila or Latrice doing a solid job and then if the other people in their group are not good, it kind of sets them up to win for the week since they've already established there's going to be a winner from each group to make up the top two. I wasn't sure whether to call Naomi not getting a top two spot here rigged since she was very clearly the second funniest of the week, but there being a winner from each group was like clearly established before the Snatch Game even happened. So I think that's just an unlikely hand dealt to Naomi rather than like Riggery. The real Riggery this episode involves Miss Monet Exchange. Her Whitney Houston was one of the worst Snatch Games, period. Not even of this group, like ever. She made so many bizarre choices from talking to an invisible Bobby Brown to being drenched in sweat by the end of it. And that's shocking to me since Monet's first Snatch Game was so good. Like, so, so good. She was 1000% saved from the bottom here. And in her place, they put Valentina, which to me, I thought was just really unfair. So Valentina is playing Eartha Kitt, but she's really playing like Eartha Kitt as Yzma from The Emperor's New Groove. And to any millennials, that's how we know Eartha Kitt. I think that's how we were all introduced to Eartha Kitt. Now, I know RuPaul has probably never seen that movie, which, like, pff, that's your loss. But it's just unfortunate that Valentina is pulling these iconic quotes from the movie, like, pull my leva, cronk. And RuPaul is just giving her, like, a blank expression, like, what the fuck are you saying right now? 
Especially when Rue chastises queens like Aja for not knowing every single 1960s reference imaginable. RuPaul not knowing like a pretty iconic 2000s movie and then that affecting the performance of a queen. It just kind of didn't sit right with me. Like, did Valentina do an exceptional snatch game regardless? No, but she definitely did better than Monet and Gia. And, like, even Latrice. Like, at least she stayed in character the whole time. Gia Guns, Jenny Bowie, good lord. There's very few drag race moments that I simply just cannot watch, but this is one of them. We left hilarious pheromone Alexis Michelle roast dumpster fire and entered... This is painful to watch and my skin is crawling and I want to leave. I feel the same way about Cynthia Lee Fontaine, Sofia Vergara. I'm just going to say it. Jenny Bowie is the worst Snatch Game performance of all time, period. They attempt to somewhat give Gia Gunn a redemption arc on her way out in this episode, but you can tell the queens were all ready for her to go, and Manila sends her ass packing. Now, the next episode is Jersey Justice, which was such an iconic challenge. Like, I remember laughing so hard when I first watched this episode live. Manila's barking, Monique literally every second she's on camera. Even queens who you wouldn't think would do well in an improv type of challenge, like Valentina and Naomi, ended up doing super well. Latrice, Trinity, and Monet were very clearly the bottom three, but unlike last episode where I felt Monet deserved a bottom two placement, here she actually gets one and I didn't think it was deserved. This season's kind of wild, but let's go into, I think, the two major reasons why Trinity the Tuck was saved from the bottom two here. One, her runway. One of the best of the season. I still think about this look to this day. The second is there is a real good chance that she goes home if she is in the bottom here from a production standpoint. Now, Manila and Monique were obviously the top two of the week. Monique had never won a lip sync on the show before. Manila just ate one up the week prior. Now, if Latrice and Trinity are in the bottom two, it's pretty plausible to infer that Manila could win the lip sync and send Trinity home in order to save her friend Latrice. Well, that won't work because Trinity was 1000% the production favorite for the season. She had one of the best brands. She was a fan favorite. She gave the producers everything they asked for. They were not going to lose Trinity here. By sacrificing Monet instead, they're taking less of a risk, especially since there was a Lala Perusa coming up, and Monet is one of the best lip syncers on this cast. So if she was in Latrice's spot here and goes home, she probably would have won her way back in, just like Latrice did. Whereas Trinity isn't as guaranteed for that to happen. So Latrice goes home, which I remember being gooped and gagged and gobsmacked at at the time. I felt so bad for her, especially since I thought it was unfair that she was in a group of three, where it was harder to stand out, unlike the other groups where there were only two. Latrice this season... I mean, it's obvious based on what was said post-season by both Latrice and other queens that the storyline the producers had set up for her on the season and what the editors put together did not line up whatsoever. I mean, Latrice has even alluded to the fact that like a specific one person had a vendetta against her and wanted to make her look bad. I mean, who knows? There's obviously some behind-the-scenes tea there that we do not know. We are not privy of. But... The fact that this season was able to take arguably the most beloved queen from the entire franchise and turn the fans against her completely was, like, wild. It was sad. It was really sad to watch. And proof of how a bad edit can turn the fan base against you in an instant. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, actually, to what happens on All Star 6 with Jan. Latrice gets undermined a lot on this season. I mean, she starts off with two solid performances in episodes one and two. She could have been in the top three for either or both, and instead she's safe until episodes three and four, where she's bottom three and then goes home. She is somewhat redeemed later in the season, but this first half of the season is not good for Latrice edit-wise, and it's really hard to see since she's obviously a wonderful human and a great competitor as well. 
So we move on to the roast, and this episode reeks of riggery. This episode had a very clear outcome, which was a Manila and Monet top two with Monique high, and then any combination of Valentina, Naomi, and Trinity in the bottom, and one of them would be low. Or, hell, just do a bottom three. They were all terrible in this roast. Now, there was a lot of speculation at the time that it was odd to have Monet and Manila just get to sit out of the Lollapurusa and how they possibly did that just to save Valentina from going home this episode. And I do think I agree. Now, from a production standpoint, it's pretty likely that Valentina or Naomi were going to go home this episode. If Valentina is in the bottom against either Trinity or Naomi, she's done for. If Naomi and Trinity are in the bottom together, Naomi's toast. So by making it a bottom four and then sending no one home, they get to keep Manila and Monet safe for the next episode and Valentina gets to stay as well. Also, you can look at it like there's justification for this Lala Perusa twist, like it's a punishment for flopping the roast and you have to fight for your spot. They do the same thing with Alala Perusa on season 14. You all stuck to the challenge. Now you're all in trouble with Mama Ru. Before we move on to Alala Perusa, I want to quickly talk about Valentina. Now, coming into the season, producers had a lot of options on what they could do with Valentina's edits. They could try and go full Valentina, like what was teased at the season 9 reunion. Or they could give her a full-on redemption arc and make her into America's sweetheart again, like she was for like the first half of season 9. But instead, she gets the delusional edit. But it's a positive delusional edit, which we don't see super often. Go watch my video on the delusional edit where I dive into this whole situation way more. Now, Valentina obviously didn't do as well in the competition as I think the fans and the producers wanted her or expected her to do. But instead, I think we get to see Valentina fleshed out as more of a real human being, and we get to know her on a completely different level. Valentina ends up coming out of the season looking better than she did on season 9, and leaving as an even bigger superstar despite having a worse run, which is honestly really great to see and a really great story that the editors put together for her. Okay, so Lala Perusa. One of the best twists the show has ever done. This season, unlike any other, it seemed like the queens were ready to play ball with the producers. From Monet not trying in Into You, to who the queens choose in this episode to lip sync against. And I mean, even Gia and Trinity staging a fight in the Snatch Game to make drama. But I think at this point we can all agree... Everything about this episode was staged, from the song choices to who the queens lip-synced against. So Latrice picks Monique, specifically just to finish that story beat where Monique sent her home. Farah picks Valentina to finish out their storyline. And then the lip-sync songs, I mean, are just too on the nose for each pair to not be rigged. Trinity gets an ass-shaking song with Peanut Butter. Because, like, let's be honest, Jasmine Masters could beat Trinity to certain songs. And if she actually tried. <laughs> so this is Trinity getting to just show off what she does best, and she easily wins. Valentina and Farah get Kitty Girl, a cute little low-energy song they can just bounce around to. Cool. Naomi and Gia Gunn get Adrenaline, the perfect song to Vogue and Pose to, which is both of their strengths. And then we get Latrice and Monique get Sissy That Walk, the death droppy, splitty, high energy dance number, perfect for the enemies to go up against and for the big grand finale. Now we're meant to believe that these songs were randomly chosen by the queens themselves, but I don't believe that for a damn second. Things worked out much too perfectly. Also, I mean, there are no consequences for the six remaining queens in the competition like it was teased to us. They all have to fight for their spot to stay, and if an eliminated queen beats them in the lip sync, they have to go home. That sets up some big stakes. But we don't see that happen even once. Latrice is let back in to the competition, and all the other queens continue on. It was kind of a best case scenario for everyone involved. I sort of feel like that was a thank you gift for playing along. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, the queens still in the competition get to stay. The early outs get one more chance to show off some of their chops and get to say goodbye again. And the last eliminated queen gets to return. What a happy ending. It was a great episode, 1,000%. I mean, it's staged, but I honestly still love it. It's great TV. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Now, there was a lot of discourse about Latrice and Monique both getting to stay rather than Gia Gunn, who people thought the adrenaline lip sync was closer. But, like, Gia Gunn's story was over. And Latrice, I think, still had a lot more to give, both narratively and competitively. So it kind of makes sense to me why she would get brought back. And it's not like she didn't eat that lip sync. I personally think she won over Monique. But, I mean, there's some varied opinions. But, I mean, we know that there wasn't a chance in hell that an eliminated queen wouldn't come back in. Because, like, what would be the point? The issue is then which queen left in the competition were they willing to sacrifice for this twist. I think out of all of them, Monique was the one they were most willing to lose here if they had to. They already sacrificed her to save Gia for another episode. They put her on the bottom again in the roast to make this twist work. She had been doing so well, but it seemed like besides being the narrator of the season, production never really saw her as a winner option, which is sad because they think a lot of fans would have loved to see her in that final two lip syncing for The Crown. Hell, I think Monique and Monet in the final two would have been amazing, but that was never going to happen, and I think she was lucky to even get saved here since production didn't seem as interested in, in her as everyone else was, as the viewers were. But also, just looking at the episode count, maybe there was no way that any queen would go home here regardless. I mean, the next episode is the clubs, then the makeover, and then the acting challenge. I mean, they have a certain amount of episodes that they need to meet, right, from VH1. So there was going to be 10 episodes. They couldn't really just cut an episode because they didn't have an extra queen. I think someone was always going to come back, and I think that there was going to be a double Shantae. So that's just my take. Let's move on to the Episode 7, Queen of Clubs Challenge. And this is one of my favorite challenges of all time. I was so sad that the All-Stars 5 Queens couldn't make it as iconic as this episode was. There's not much to discuss about this episode now that we're past this huge twist and in the final leg of the season. I think production was now willing to get rid of Valentina since she continued to not deliver. One thing I thought wasn't fair was how there was a group of three and then two groups of two. I mean, that's a whole extra person to help make your club that the other two groups didn't have. So it's no surprise that that group ended up winning and had the coolest looking club. So they should have done the makeover first and then do this challenge when there were only six queens left, but whatever. Episode 8, Makeover, and uh, I still will never understand how Monet won this episode when Monique and Trinity were right there. I mean, how many times do we hear Michelle complain about queens just wearing bodysuits? Not only that, but Monet was wearing the much better look of the two, the more extravagant look. And I thought putting your makeover partner in something less flattering and appealing than yours was a major no-no in this challenge. Like, think Aquaria in her makeover. She was almost put in the bottom for that and probably should have been. Naomi, Trinity, and Monique were really, to me, clearly the top three of that week. They had solid concepts behind their looks, whereas Monet's were just pretty gold looks. But also... Monet had never looked more gorgeous than she did in this look. So, you know what? Maybe I do get it. But Naomi wins the season. She does the thing. She solidifies herself in Drag Race history. Let's talk about Naomi. She had probably the strangest road to the Final Four this season. She was the third place gal for the first three weeks in a row. Then she has two bottom placements in a row. Then she finally gets her win and then narrowly misses going home the week after. While I don't think she had a high chance of winning at the finale, I still think Naomi shattered expectations for her going into the season, from redeeming herself in Snatch Game to making the biggest strategic move ever at this point in Drag Race. And, I mean, it was the move that got her to the finale, because if she sends Latrice home at the makeover, she's toast at the top five, regardless of who wins, or who is in the bottom next to her. 
So by sending Manila home here, she single-handedly guarantees her finale spot, and that is the most boss thing I have ever heard. Naomi has turned into one of the biggest superstars of the franchise, and I think a lot of it is due to her time on All Stars 4 and the stamp that she made on the series here. So Manila and Latrice are bottom two in this makeover, which I agree with, but Manila gets the critique that her outfits were too basic, which, I mean, they were, but they also had at least a concept. I, I just thought it was weird to throw that comment out when Monet was standing right there, but maybe I shouldn't harp on this too much. I promise I love Monet. I just don't get this win. Also, you just know when Naomi pulled Manila's lipstick that World of Wonder saw dollar signs immediately. Talk about iconic drag race moments. I mean, I know they shattered all of our hearts in the moment, but I'm happy we can all look back now and just appreciate what an amazing moment of reality television this was. Also, can I just say, Manila going home on the makeover was better for her career than if she would have just won the season, 1000%. Forever being cemented as one of the gaggiest eliminations of all time, makes her one of the most sympathetic figures in the franchise for years to come. I mean, she got to slay almost the entire season and then leave with everyone begging for more. It doesn't get much better than that. We can kind of skip past that terrible Sex in the City acting challenge. It's sad Latrice goes home here, especially because I thought she did like the third best of the week, but it also makes sense that the returning queen didn't make it to the finale since that hadn't happened at this point. Yeah, the only thing I genuinely enjoy about this episode is life's not fair. And the Janet Jackson lip sync. I mean, seeing them lip sync to my favorite Janet song was at least some retribution for having to sit through <laughs> Sex and the Kitty Girl. Trinity gets her fourth win in this episode. And yeah, going into the finale, she definitely was the front runner. And I can't say I was shocked. She did so well on season nine. And at the time, I thought she had a big chance of winning that season. So seeing her come back so soon and destroy another season felt kind of inevitable. But we're left with a pretty shocking final four. I know preseason, a lot of people thought it would be like a Manila, Latrice, Valentina, Trinity top four. And for only one of those queens to actually make it on this season is a lot of fun and it makes things unexpected. The exact opposite of All Stars 5, right? Where the three queens you fully expect to make top three, make top three. So let's talk about this finale. These last two episodes really just kind of kill the momentum of a great season. That terrible acting challenge and now this terrible remix and this wonky ass double crowning. It's obvious production never planned a double crowning. So what happened? Let's try and figure this out. I think that they kind of backed themselves into a corner by establishing Trinity as this massive threat. I mean, even weeks where she was in the bottom, she was getting these critiques like, you are the top tier bitch, like you are born to do drag, like blah, 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 blah. They saved her from the bottom when they could. They gave her every win they possibly could. She had the best possible track record that she could hope for. So what happens then when she absolutely flubs the finale? What do you do then? Well, what about Monique? She destroyed the entire season, did well in every single challenge. Yes, even the one she bought him for. Oh, but she also flubs the finale. No shade to Naomi, but I don't think production was ever going to crown her. So that leaves Monet. And for much of the season, I don't think they knew exactly what to make of Monet. Sometimes she was sacrificed to save another queen from the bottom. Sometimes she was saved from the bottom. She won a challenge that was highly controversial. Her track record was all over the place, but she won this last episode, 1000%. She obliterated this final episode. So how do you not give her the crown? If they were picking a final two based completely on this episode, it might have been Naomi and Monet. I mean, Naomi's final runway was absolutely stunning, and the Super Queen verse that she had was short but fine, and had a great look to go along with it. Monique seemed to give up in this episode. I mean, her Super Queen performance was low energy. Her verse was kind of flat. Trinity did the best she could, but this kind of stuff just isn't her strong suit. But the whole storyline throughout the season was that Trinity was one of the ones to beat. 
and she was at a level of drag that was beyond what most were capable of. So her not making the final two would have felt very odd, and it would have left that storyline in kind of a weird position, since most of the season were basically watching her winning edit. But you also couldn't deny giving Monet the win with how she devoured the entire finale. And she had three wins on the season. And then, I mean, <laughs> Trinity falling in the lip sync. I'm like, oh, how do you not give it to Monet? But the entire season was basically giving it to Trinity. So somehow they thought the happy medium would be to give it to them both. I'm not sure. It was messy. And I wish they would have just crowned Monet solo. But they didn't. And here we are. Overall, I do think All-Stars 4 is one of the top seasons of the franchise. Yes, the last two episodes do kind of tank some of the momentum, but 8 out of 10 episodes are top tier and so much fun to rewatch. Not all seasons have big rewatch value, so that gives it major points in my book. The double win sucks, but like at this point I just consider it camp, so whatever. I want to know your thoughts. Do you disagree with anything that I said in this video? Politely, <laughs> nicely, <laughs> explain to me why you do. And when you were watching this season, who were you rooting for? Were you shocked when it was Monet or Trinity in the top two? Were you rooting for someone else? I want to know all of your thoughts. Thank you again, Atlas VPN, for sponsoring today's video. And again, the link is in the description below and the pinned comment for access to a three-year subscription of Atlas VPN for just $1.99 a month. And you get a 30-day money-back guarantee. So we love that. Thank you again, Atlas VPN. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much to my patrons listed here. And here are the links to all of my social medias where I'm a Twitter, I talk shit, on my Instagram, I have all kinds of fun polls and stats and things like that. It has been a really long day, actually. We haven't had a video this long in a while. So it's been a long day. My mouth is very dry. It's kind of like your vagina. I had to do it. Uh, very long day. Solving the mystery of <laughs> which, <laughs> which meme from this season do I use in my daily life far too much? And randomly, it's this one. This is a place for legends, okay? I don't, it's so specific, but I kind of just live. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. I will catch you in the next one.